Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Benoit Tawari. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good. So, uh, uh, I'm Benoit Tiwari from Cal, Cal State Fullerton. I tried to make it too general. So, uh, if uh, you want to go uh, deeper, more technical, we can, uh, we can do that after the talk is uh, done. Uh, the, the title, as you saw, is Global Trends uh, of Landslide and Mudslide Disasters and Their Impacts on Community. Uh, so uh, my contribution in uh, world landslide community, if I break them into pieces as, a, uh, as an academician, uh, a professor of civil and environmental engineering who is working on landslides and earthquake disasters, I can uh, divide them this way. I am a, a very active member and the, uh, the Geo Challenge Director for uh, the, the Geo Institute of American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, then uh, I am an associate editor for uh, the Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering, which is the main journal that handles uh, uh, issues pertinent to uh, landslides, slope stability, dams, and embankment type of uh, issues. Uh, I am the Vice President of the International Consortium on Landslides, uh, and it has very high impact journal called Landslides, which is the only full color journal. Uh, and uh, I'm the executive editor of, uh, of that uh, journal. And we also publish few, uh, uh, you see, uh, the uh, proceedings. Every three year, we organize a World Landslide Forum, and we get uh, over 500, 600 uh, the papers uh, in that uh, forum. And we also, you see, uh, if you recall in 2014, there was a uh, international uh, day, there was international symposium organized by UN on uh, disaster reduction. Uh, it was in Tohoku, uh, Japan, and that time, uh, our consortium, we promised to uh, publish uh, uh, a book called uh, Landslide Dynamics uh, Interactive Teaching Tool. So there are hundreds of tools we published. We made them very, very simple, especially for developing countries. Uh, that way, the academic institutions or the community can use those tools to deal with landslide uh, issues. Uh, I'm editor. I'm an editor of uh, those uh, books. Uh, I am the managing director uh, of the International Consortium on Geo Disaster Reduction. In, in 2014, we did uh, the uh, 10th International Symposium on uh, Geo Disaster Reduction at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, uh, they also have, this uh, uh, consortium also has um, uh, its own uh, journal. It is open access uh, uh, with Springer and uh, it publishes Geo Environmental Disasters. I'm one among the associate editor-in-chief on that. So the reason I brought all this thing up here is being involved. There's one more institution I'm involved with. You know, Cal, Cal State Fullerton is very heavy in, uh, uh, you know, training undergraduate studi students in research. So we focus our effort to train the students on research and hands-on projects. That way, those students, after graduation, they can go back to community. And as you know, our community, biggest community is Orange County, LA County, and within Southern California and region. Uh, because of that, the Council for Undergraduate Research, that's the National Council, is uh, actually uh, supporting the activities of uh, under, predominantly undergraduate institution, uh, like ours, uh, to support the undergraduate research, which is one among the high-impact practices. And I'm the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the chair of engineering division of that council. Uh, and that council publishes a journal called SPUR. So there are a few articles. We, we get them uh, get in this journal that deals with uh, natural disasters. So with all these involvements, uh, I uh, am fortunate enough to deal with uh, different issues throughout the world. Uh, uh, they are dealing with natural disasters mostly earthquakes, and uh, landslides. 
Today, I will focus on a few things uh, because uh, it is an hour-long uh, presentation. A little less than an hour. I'll try to uh, see how, uh, uh, how it goes. And I'll talk a little bit about the natural disasters and community first, and then the loss due to, the, due to landslides. So uh, what uh, is uh, the community losing with those landslides? And because the landslide, you see, the terminology landslide is used for anything. Sometimes, you know, being in Southern California, uh, every time, you know, even though it is a rock fall, we call it mudslide. So mudslide is a, a very nice uh, word and uh, most of the people refer to in Southern California. Then when we go to Japan, people call landslide. They don't even uh, talk about mudslide. So depending on different countries, uh, the terminologies are different. So today I'll try to walk you through seven or eight different types of uh, this. I call it mass wasting or slow failure. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go through how dangerous they are or how to deal with them. Uh, and then I'll talk about the causes of those landslides, which is very important. And I'll, uh, with the interest of time, uh, I can't go through everything that I had dealt with throughout my career, but I'll try to pick three uh, different uh, uh, events where, uh, you know, the, the landslides were critical. Uh, mostly earthquake-induced landslide, and I will uh, have a case of rainfall-induced landslide, and I'll pick one, uh, and then some landslides in Southern California, uh, and uh, the at the end, I'll try to wrap up with the precautionary measures. So I'm not dealing with engineering measures here, uh, because that's a different thing. Today, I, I, I thought I'll make it too general, uh, but we can, if you have interest, we can talk about that after uh, the, the, the talk is done. Then I'll summarize and conclude. So if we go through the major uh, natural disasters, you see, earthquake is one and scary disaster. That kills uh, a lot of people. And the landslides is another one. So landslides, the, the, the word landslide is uh, dangerous because if earthquake comes, it triggers landslide. If heavy rain comes, it triggers landslides, right? So wildfire, it triggers landslides. So there are so many uh, primary disasters we have that actually converts into secondary disaster like landslide. And floods are, and throughout the world, floods are killing a lot of people every year. Uh, and a storm and hurricane, uh, extreme weather, that could be very hot weather, that could be very cold weather, that kill people too. Uh, and the tsunami. So the tsunami is, uh, there are different reasons uh, uh, we, we see tsunami. One is earthquake itself, and we, uh, we have evidence, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, that triggered big tsunami. Even before that, in 2005, Indian Ocean tsunami, that kills, killed thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. But mostly, whenever you have earthquake, some, you know, the worst disaster that earthquake can trigger is tsunami. And at the same time, when we have underwater sea uh, landslide, then that triggers tsunami too. Uh, and wildfire that we are dealing with. Uh, in Southern California every year. And volcanic eruption, we don't see them here, but in the U.S. is facing volcanic eruptions frequently, and Japan, Indonesia, those countries face them right, like a routine. Uh, today, we'll be talking about landslides. We'll talk about the other disasters when it comes to the causes of landslide. Uh, if we want to see the, the record from 1990 to 2014, so when the UN had that conference in 2014, uh, they uh, requested all countries to make the disaster report. And uh, they made it public. Uh, and if you, see, if you want to see the record there, you see like uh, uh, in the US, I broke them up into few countries only. So, 
almost 80% of the, the natural disasters that the U.S. faces are flood and storm. But in terms of death toll, storm and flood contribute similar number. And there is no landslide involved here, because if you talk about those hurricane, uh, the, the, uh, you see uh, the uh, tor tornado, all those things, the, the number of deaths or casualty from landslide is pretty low and it does not come here. But we have evidence that frequently in Southern California. Uh, and then the, the economic loss, again, it is more storm and flood contributes a lot. But at the same time, you see, if you look into economic loss, earthquake contributes a lot. That's mainly because uh, many of you might have, may still remember, Northridge earthquake. So we evidence similar earthquakes. But Northridge, Northridge is one among the most devastating earthquakes in the history because we lost a lot of property with Northridge earthquake. But if we compare that with Japan, you see, the frequency of storm is equally good. Storm and floods were almost similar per person, but you can see landslides. So Japan uh, get frequent landslide disasters. And if you uh, see the, uh, the death, almost 90% of the death were from earthquake because in 2011 they lost over 20,000 people just because of tsunami. Uh, and uh, economic loss, same thing. I mean, almost over 80% 80, 80 of the economic loss was uh, because of uh, that devastating earthquake they had. Uh, but if you look into the developing country now, I mean, these two are developed country where there is, I prefer to say, U.S. is also developed in terms, in terms of rescue operation. But when we compare ourselves with Japan, we are a little behind on rescue. Uh, but if you, you look into developing countries where the landslides are still big, uh, you know, it has over 8% contribution into total frequency of natural disasters. Uh, and of course, floods and storms contribute a lot, same thing. But you see, when you look into the death toll, uh, the earthquake, uh, like even though only 3% earthquake there was only 3% frequency of the earthquake in India. The death toll was 41%. That's mainly because uh, it, 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 it's so devastating that it was hard to rescue people. And Japan, it flipped. If it would, not, it would not have been that tsunami, only earthquake hardly killed people in Japan. Uh, and if you see the property loss in, in, uh, uh, in uh, economic loss in, in India, still floods contribute a lot. When you look into China, uh, the landslide has a strong contribution, almost same 8%, so similar number, uh, but the, the, uh, the death toll with landslide is almost 7%. That's mainly because in the history, past 10, 15 years, China had big landslides, some of them buried the entire city. So uh, if we want to look into the, the numbers, average loss per year, the U.S. lose about 477 uh, uh, people per year due to natural disasters. You see, the property loss is $104 billion in average per year. But if you look into Japan, it is even more. It lost more people. That's mainly because of that tsunami in 2011. But if you look into China and uh, India, you see they lose a lot of people uh, with uh, natural disaster. This is not only landslides. The total. Yes, all of them, including earthquake. Uh, and then you see the property loss is less here because you see dollar conversion makes it a little less, and the property value there is less compared to the property value in Japan and U.S., but these are the numbers you can see. So from here, we can see that Japan and U.S. are equally vulnerable to different type of natural disaster. At the same time, developing countries are following us. Uh, now let's switch gear to landslide. So that 
we don't get UEN or that type of report to see the loss. So I had to look into different literature to figure out the, uh, the, uh, the loss, but it typically the world uh, lose about 600 people per year due to landslide only. And in Japan, if we talk about the property loss, Japan lose about $4 billion a year just due to landslide. And US lose about one to three billion dollar a year due to landslide and lose 25 to 50 people a year. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the country like Nepal, there is no uh, statistics on the property loss, but it's 364 people uh, are, you know, the country loses those people due to landslides. And the Italy, one to two billion dollar. Italy is one among uh, the, uh, the countries that has frequent landslide issues mainly because of rainfall, uh, and India has one to two billion dollar uh, probably lost due to landslide every year, and China has as high as India. Uh, but the, the, the fact is mostly when the country report the landslide loss, they don't separate the loss due to landslide uh, from the loss due to uh, the floods. Most of those losses are included in flood. Most of those losses are included in the loss due to earthquake. So the number we are seeing here is, I think, underestimated. So we lose more money and more, uh, more people every year because of landslides. And most of the, uh, the losses uh, uh, we, we face in our daily life due to uh, landslides are transportation facility. That's more uh, common. And the burning example is Big Sur landslide still we're not able to drive in that road, on that road. And uh, the, the buildings, I mean, we, ha we, have, you know, we have seen those. We have evidenced those losses in Southern California and many other infrastructure that include, you know, water supply pipeline, that include the gasoline, uh, the, the gas pipeline. There's, that triggers secondary disaster. If the water supply pipeline breaks, then the water comes out and that is more dangerous than anything else. Right, so uh, if uh, one statistic says that, you see, uh, there are 2,000, I mean, not all landslides are fatal. Not all landslides kill people. Uh, and we have so many landslides in Southern California, we lost property, the roads were blocked, but still, we were able to save people. Uh, but still, 2,620 federal landslides were recorded from 2004 to 2010. Actually, Dave Bentley did uh, research on that from UK, and he published this in, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the, in one of the, uh, the journals. Uh, and you can see uh, the distribution of all those federal landslides. I mean, in the US, mostly, you know, North America and South America, they have a, a pretty high uh, death toll uh, with landslides. But see the concentration here in Asia. So Asia, Asian countries have more concentration compared to uh, the North America, uh, but a lot of people will lose. Uh, and then if you look into the numbers, in those past six years, someone counted over 30,000 people died just due to landslides all over the world. If we talk about U.S., so uh, this uh, uh, map tells how vulnerable our locations are in terms of landslides, right? We are here, so we have high susceptibility of landslide, at the same time, high incidence of landslide. So Southern California is, uh, even north, we have different types of landslides, but California is uh, given for landslides. And if you look up all the way to Oregon, Washington, same thing. The cause is different. If you go north, rainfall-induced landslides are more common. South, you see our geology is so frizzle, you, you just need to get small amount of rainfall to get those landslides. Uh, and if you go to uh, the east, east coast like, you know, Virginia, you, uh, uh, all the way up Pennsylvania, and down uh, North Carolina, uh, those, those areas, they, uh, they are vulnerable to landslides, they have high susceptibility at the same time, in the incidence of landslides. And then Colorado, Utah, uh, Idaho, those locations are uh, pretty severely affected by landslide disaster. One of the articles says that over we, we, we get over 100,000 landslides 
every year in the U.S. Do we hear that? No, because so many landslides uh, occur in a place that no one is affected, right? Unless it blocks Highway 1, our big highway, unless it kills people, we don't hear them. Unless it goes to media, unless it is, uh, the media is attracted by that, we don't hear them. But the reality, we face so many landslides every year, big and small. So if you see the statistics of landslides uh, in the U.S., uh, this is the distribution of landslides. So scale-wise, the, the sizes depend on how big uh, the mass was triggered. And then all black dots you can see here are fatal landslides that killed people in the history. And I'm pretty sure that you, you still remember the Osho landslide in Washington that attracted media for months and months, right? That killed so many people is one among them. But the problem we have, the human memory of disaster. I used to tell three months. After three months, you forget those disasters unless the media tells you and reminds you again. So that is unfortunate, but that's the reality. Even after earthquake, right? So whenever I go out, not only in the US, abroad, after the earthquake, as a reconnaissance team, Everyone is, oh no, we have to do something because we don't want to uh, lose that many people or property after the earthquake. I go there again after six months, people forget. So, and these statistics are very good for us to remind that, uh, you see, disaster come again and again, and there's a frequency of disaster. Mostly when we talk about landslides and debris flow mudslide, there's a frequency of those disasters. We simply forget them or the people who are affected live out of the area, and the new people go there, and then they have no idea how devastating those events were. Uh, let's see now, let's go with the terminology of the landslides, because whenever you know, media comes, uh, even rockfall, they say mudslides, so I'll try to do landslide 101 type of lecture now talking about the type of landslide. So first is rotational slide. For me, this is the most dangerous one. It can kill a lot of people if the consequence is bad. So what happens in the rotational slides is they're big. Uh, I mean, you see, they slide this way like a rotation. They rotate against a plane. So this mass tries to go down, and then there's a stable rock or st stronger mass to resist that. So there's a fight going on at the contact. And if this will win, like a tug of war, right? So if this will win, it will slide. If this will win, it will not slide. What is stopping that is the frictional resistance. Now let's add a little physics here. So a little frictional resistance between this thing and this thing. So we measure that with, we call that friction angle. So go with that. If the friction angle is 15 degrees, then it is stronger than the soil with friction angle 4 degrees or something like that, right? So higher the friction angle, higher the resistance created here, higher potential for them to stop the movement. The worst thing for these type of landslides are water table. So if you do drilling or if you put oil, uh, uh, if you put oil, you know, any type of drilling, then you can pump the water out, right? After you hit the groundwater table, it is stable. It fluctuates by three, four, five meters, if possible. Sometimes just by one meter within a year. But there is a layer of water below the, the earth. It is hard for me to tell, uh, to, to tell my students. I mean, most of the time, students don't visualize that, but I know you'll, you understand that. So several feet or several meters below the ground, we have static water level from where we face the water out, right? That is dangerous. That is good. If it is close to the ground surface, it's good if we're facing the water for irrigation or water supply for anything, right? If we're talking about landslide, it is bad. So closer the water table from the ground surface, worse for the landslide. And when you have rainfall, what happens is rainfall will go down recharge that water table. So in wet season, the water table is high. In dry season, it goes down. It fluctuates 
between them. So higher it is dangerous. So wet season, these type of landslides are vulnerable to, uh, these type of landslides are vulnerable. They may slide down. And the mass is pretty big, very, very big. Example of that, how many of you have seen this landslide? It's in Rancho Paz Verde, Portuguese bend landslide. I would say the famous Portuguese bend landslide that we are dealing with for almost maybe a century. This is a big landslide, but if you make a line here, and then this is cross section. So if you slice that and look from the side, it's not that location. It will, it will be similar to that. And this has been, this Portuguese Bend landslide has been uh, uh, in 1956. I mean, it started re being reactivated. The problem with that is once it's stable, the water table goes down, stable, nice. Then what happens is after the extreme event, water table goes up, it reactivates. Once it moves, it loses that friction angle I told you before. So the resistance decreases with the movement. And then you have all shearing going on, your rock converts into soil, soil softens, and then it will slide again. And this landslide it is over 75 meter deep, over 200 or 250 foot deep mass. And continuously sliding, I mean, some people say it is eight foot per year. But what I could see is every year, four or five times I go to that area, that landslide with my students. We are doing few, I mean, little research on that. And it, every time you see a new road, because eight foot a year is a lot, right? But it's so big, it, it, it requires a lot of money to control it, right? So what is controlling here is the soil you have here is exposed at the bottom, this very bad soil. Those who uh, have little knowledge in geology, you might have heard shale, that's one type of rock. It has a soil called, the mineral called smectite or monmotonite. That is the worst soil I see uh, in the world that has the lowest strength. When it gets water, it expands significantly. And then it reduces the strength and it makes everything vulnerable. So Portuguese Bend Landslide has that. And how do we know the strength of that? You see, if you do a little drilling, you can take the soil out and you can measure a property called plasticity index. That way you can get the shearing resistance. This is my chart. I, uh, people use this chart frequently. Uh, and uh, the minimum shear strength of the soil you can even get from this if you know the liquid limit. So residual is the minimum uh, resistance of the soil. Fully softened is a little more than that, but once the landslide moves, it mobilizes that minimum strength drops. And then when it is reactivated, reactivated, that minimum shear strength mobilizes. So it's bad. The worst thing is a landslide already slid down maybe 100 years ago, 50 years ago, or 20 years ago, that has more vulnerability to slide. This is, that is worst because the mass is huge. Think about 250 or uh, 300 foot deep sliding mass. Huge mass is mobilized. That can block the river pretty easily. So these are the charts you can use to, to estimate those frictional resistance. Then there's another type. We'll, we'll come back to Portuguese bend in a while. Uh, the, the other type of uh, slide, which is a little less dangerous but more frequent, is the translational slide. What happened in these type of slides is like that. You see, you have very strong bedrock. You see, rocks, same rock after 100 years becomes soil, right? So rock disintegrates. You see cracks on the rock. And then, fortunately, we are in an area where we don't have snow. But if you talk about Maine and Virginia, those places, that crack is filled with water. And then when water freezes, it expands, you know that, volume increases, and the crack keep on increasing, and all chemical things we have, they will, that will disintegrate the rock. It converts into soil, right? But the thing is, this is soil, top soil, but this is a very strong rock. What happens is when you have rainfall, the water percolates down from the soil, and when it hits, 
the bedrock, very strong rock, it cannot go, I mean, the permeability or the rate the water percolates in is way less compared to the rate it is going down. And then it will make the contact between this very weathered soil or rock and the strong rock very weak. And then once it loses stability, because with water it increases weight, at the same time it reduces the resistance here and it will slide. So this is called translational slide. So uh, the, the, uh, the criteria you need for this, uh, for the soil to be translational, uh, the slide to be translational is the thickness of the soil that is sliding down is way less compared to the length of the sliding mass. Previously you saw it is a soil, so uh, thickness is pretty big. It could be clay, it could be, uh, let's say, uh, silty clay, any type of soil, but it is soil to that thick layer. The other type is block slide, which is similar to uh, the translational, but you see it is a rock. So what happens is at the contact between, this is rock block, and the contact is very weak. Good example of that is I was in, uh, in Montecito area a few, uh, a few days ago, and what I could see there, not only there, a lot of places in Southern California, we have the shale. If you go to Japan, they call it mudstone. If you go to Europe, they call it marl. The common thing that all of them have is that weak mineral, smectite or monolonite, they're very weak. So if it is mudstone or claystone or shale, when water penetrates in, when it is heavily weathered and water penetrates in, that makes the contact very weak. So if it is near the river, water penetrates in anyway with the erosion, right? Or sometimes you know, with cracks and those things, water percolates down through the crack and makes this contact very weak and then slide everything as a block. So it is called block slide. It gets huge mass coming down. And most often, this is the rock fall is uh, you encounter that most often. This is not as dangerous as the rotational slide, but this is the most frequent one we see everywhere. The size is small, but you see that. But the, the, the worst disaster you can get with this type of rock falls is, you see, the chunk of rocks or boulders are coming down. And if it is unfortunate, if someone is, I mean, I have seen that. I have seen cars pancaked with, with uh, uh, those uh, boulders coming down, rock falls coming down. And this, this uh, picture was from 2011 to Hokkaido. What happens is when you have earthquake, it is less likely that big rotational slide would immobilize. But with earthquake, Rock, these type of rock slides are common because it's the earthquake force that is shaking the ground is enough to dislodge the mass. So this is after the Tohoku earthquake in Japan and at the, the back of both houses were uh, gone with that, uh, like that, you see, in the road. So it affects mostly in, at the back of the building or sometimes it affects the, the road. Mostly it affects the road. But you see, we can put uh, the, uh, uh, we have different techniques to control them. A different country uses a different techniques, and the techniques depends on how much money we have to, how much money we want to spend. But this is less dangerous, but more frequent uh, compared to the rotational slide. So I personally hate rotational slide. You will see why you hate the rotational slides. The other one is topple. So toppling is like that. It's some of the cracks in the rock when you drive, I would say, if you have been to Ensenada, taking that highway one, before you hit Ensenada, you can see a nice vertical, uh, those uh, vertical joints. So what happens is when these joints are filled with uh, water, it freezes, water freezes sometime, but you see that water will push this joint back. So the, the width of the joint keeps on increasing and the depth of the joint keeps on increasing and at some point it topples down. That's called toppling. But you see, the effect of toppling, you can estimate. You can see, hey, the, this, the rock may topple down. It's not as dangerous and as, and as frequent as the rock fall. This is interesting. So lateral spread is another interesting thing. You see, you have a flat land sometimes, flat. You see, one of the criteria for us to get landslides or mudslide or rock slide, whatever we call, is a slope, right? You have a slope for the gravitational flow of the materials. It's a gravitational flow. But sometimes what happens is the flat area, I start getting slide like that. 
How does it happen? You see, we have that in Southern California. We call the, 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 uh, the phenomena uh, the liquefaction. How many of you have heard of that? You see, what happens is if it is very loose sand you have and the water table is above that, when you have earthquake shaking, then the earthquake force will push the water. Water, wherever it gets pressure, it distributes the same pressure everywhere, right? Good example of that is if you buy the, the, the milk in a gallon, push from the side, milk goes up, right? Same thing for water bottle. So that's the property of water. So what happens is when it gets hit from the, the earthquake, the water will try to push up. Right? And then what happens? That sand completely loses the strength. And then whole sand becomes fluid or li liquid. We call that liquefaction. Think about that. You see, a layer of the soil above that, a nice soil, but maybe 10 or 15 foot below that, you have that liquid layer. And then that requires only gentle slope towards the stream like that. This is a canal to get that landslide. And a lot of times, this is typical along the river bank. What is this phenomenon affecting? This, this thing is affecting, this event is affecting breezes mostly. That huge chunk of soil coming down and hit the, the wall of the breeze. We call them abutment of the breeze. So this happens only during earthquake. This is the thing that is debris flow is the worst because uh, uh, when you see when you have this area with creek very weak and then if you get landslide or something here because of rainfall then sometimes that that mass after it dislodges from the original source it comes down along the creek or sometimes just along the slope and then it spreads and that's the, the most I mean, that's dangerous. We see that frequently all over the world. So this is not soil mass moving. When soil mixes with a lot of water, then we call them debris. So it's a debris flow coming down, and then that hit anything. The problem with that is because you have a lot of water, any boulders, big soil mass, plus sometimes even the trees slide down with momentum, once the, those big boulders, you know, the slush just separate out from the slope, it doesn't need anything. It can easily slide down and hit any building. I mean, and then it hits the, 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 the trees first. Tree fall down, goes with it, and bring anything it has with it. So maybe 10 foot wide creek converts into 200 foot wide creek with these events. So these are called debris flow. What happens is when you have, let's say this is a, a soil mass and you have a boulder here, and then when water is coming down, so it tries to go up, right? It cannot, it will push. It tries, then what it does is it goes below at the contact between the soil and the boulder. The water will go down. What it does, it, it will scour the base of the boulder, and then at some point, it will slide down. And the consequence, if it is, let's say, three, four miles in the source, three, four miles upstream of this source, all those debris are accumulated, and then you need five or six boulders to come down to push the other boulders. So what it does is with the passes of the flow, with the progression of the flow, it, it creates its own environment. It accumulates more and more and more and more debris. That causes devastation. And you'll see a few examples. One uh, example is Montecito uh, debris flow. Uh, I'll, I have a few pictures from there. Uh, but I'll tell you uh, a little bit about that. And then, is sometimes the debris mass is so big. The, the problem I have seen all over the world is this. You have debris coming. It's called debris fan. What I have seen is every 15 to 20 years, you get debris flow again and again. You see, you see when you get rainfall, it is associated with rainfall, right? And if you have 15, 20 years return period rainfall, you get debris flow coming down. And in 15, 20 years, this is a nice place. The vegetation comes up. Wow, nice, nice flat area. 
I want to make my house there, right? And people make house or, or the farming because they forget the history. And you end up having this one. This is a culvert made on debris. And about 50 foot below this, there is a breeze buried on the debris. So the mass it can bring is tremendously high. Debris flow is very, very powerful. Sometimes if you don't have big debris like that, this is, you see the size, they're big, big rock pieces, right? But when we talk about Montecito, you'll see a different thing. Uh, but sometimes, you see, there is no boulder around the area, right? But there's a source area, the mass separated out, and it came to the area. So it is in Japan. In 2014, uh, a lot of people died with that incident. It, it was in Hiroshima. But it frequently happens all over the world. Uh, and see, a lot of uh, houses got buried, which is similar to what happened in Mondecito, right? But the difference is that it is more mud. I call it mud slide, not the debris slide, right? Debris flow. But there is a technique to estimate that, you see? How can we estimate the amount of uh, uh, the, uh, the debris coming down? It's simple equation. Q is the, the runoff. When you have rainfall, right? Sometimes if the soil is uh, good enough, it will, the water percolates down to recharge the water table. Again, I'm telling, it, it's telling you, it's bad for the rotational slides. But you see, sometimes uh, it is good because uh, it does not increase the erosion, right? And then soil has its own capacity. Whatever amounts remains, then it slides down, it, uh, it flows down, around the area as a surface flow. We call it runoff, okay? That's the runoff amount uh, in a cubic foot per second. And then R is the, uh, the relief factor. So deeper, the steeper the slope, higher the amount of debris we're expecting, because the energy, the whole thing flowing down, will be high, right? And then VI is the vegetation index. This is very important. If the area is heavily visited, then the mass is less. If the area lost everything because of wildfire or deforestation or overgrazing, then this mass increases, the amount of debris in, uh, flow increases. So this is a crude, simple. In 2014, we had a, uh, a few debris flow incidences in Southern California. You might have uh, remembered it. And then I was part of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the national team to uh, go and uh, do some survey on that with my students and a few of my colleagues uh, from UCLA and, and uh, from uh, the industry. Uh, and we use, we put that, that, I just copied and pasted from that report we created. Every avalanche is big. So if the size become big, we call them avalanche. So this is an example. After 2015, uh, Gorkha earthquake in Nepal, this is one among the, the most popular tourist area for people who are doing hiking or mountaineering, they go there. It's not that far from the capital city. And the mass, this is all, you know, snow-capped mountains. What happened was, you see, the, there's a weathering going on in the rock, and then you have snow, and the, the contact with the snow and the, uh, the soil is weak. Then they were shaking with the earthquake. That dislodged the big chunk of Devry, and if you talk about the vertical height, it's about vertical elevation difference from the source to this point is about three kilometers. It's huge. Imagine. It's in Nepal. It's called, if you have been to Nepal, it's uh, called Langtang. And whole thing came down and buried, if you want to see the close picture of that, this is a mass that buried 300 people who were, mo many of them were foreigners who were there for mountaineering. And they couldn't rescue them because it's a remote area, but they were, um, the, the wind velocity was so strong that all houses they had in, in, in this side, and mostly this side, they blew off 
with a strong wind uh, force. And this mass is about 7 million cubic yard. It blocked the river completely, but fortunately the river opened up. That did not accumulate up, but there was one among the worst disaster. And I was uh, uh, interviewed by Nature at that time and uh, the, for the cause of disaster, and I and my colleagues from uh, USGS, we went there, we flew to that area, and we did investigation. The thing is, the source was very high. Uh, this is called debris avalanche. There, I mean, huge masses coming down. Now, what triggers landslide? There are so many things that we have in Southern California that triggers landslide. One is definitely intense rainfall. We don't have intense rainfall, but see, our geology is so fragile. We are in such a fragile place that even a small amount of rainfall compared to uh, those countries like India and China trigger a lot of uh, debris flow or mudslides. And the rapid snow melts. So if, if the snow melts rapidly, uh, then that will recharge the water table. And that triggers landslide. And then change in water level plus the coastal evolution. I mean, this is one thing that we ignore, we forget. But you see, in the coastal area, the type of soil uh, and the interaction with water plays an important role. I'll show that in a while. Uh, and then volcanic eruption. So when volcanic, volcano erupts, you, you have seen the Mount St. Helen disaster, right? So it can trigger a mountain sliding down. At the same time, when the volcano comes up, it will change the topography. And the earthquakes are the frequent triggers of uh, landslides. But a lot of landslides we see in the world are anthropogenic. That means man-made. We trigger them, right? Good example of that is a wildfire. So, we don't do that, we do that, I don't know. Wildfires, you see, it's, it's, a, it's a gray zone, whether it is the, is the man-made cause or the natural, but I put them as a man-made here, uh, the wildfire. And then the, the faulty construction, if you, if, I mean, I have seen few cases, even in the US, that we are putting huge structure at landslide area. So if it is old landslide, Dormant now, not moving, but if you try to disturb it, it will slide down, right? So that's, uh, that's another reason. And deforestation. Forestation, you see, what forest does is it, it capture or it take the rainwater. That way it does not let the water go down to recharge the water table. At the same time, to run off. And the roots help to, to control the soil erosion. But if we lose forest, then... A problem. Now you have, uh, you see, the vegetation index that I showed you becomes smaller, and the amount of debris coming down will be big. And inappropriate querying. You, know, you see, we do querying uh, mostly for mining, stone mining, or other type of mining. But if we leave that area open without treatment, then we're expecting landslides. And the the rice cultivation. You see, rice requires a lot of water, and you have to, we have to inundate that water for months, and that helps the, the groundwater table to recharge. If you have a, a leakage there, they'll uh, raise the water table. And water management. So if the water management is poor, especially Southern California, if we are not managing our water, surface water nicely, then you're expecting landslides coming in. And improper farming practices, uh, and mostly overgrazing. Uh, when you go to a uh, few countries like China, India, at the same time you go to uh, Switzerland, topography is similar, but the difference is one in the same altitude, there's no vegetation at all because they were using that for overgrazing. For grazing. At the same time, Switzerland is still better because once they use the vegetation for grazing, they plant the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bushes or those grasses there. So let's see how rainfall effect affects landslides. You see, there are two factors that are important. Number one, and there are so many other factors. The very simple factor is intensity of rainfall. How big rain we are getting, right? How many inches of rain we are getting per year, per, per, per hour. At the same time, how long was the rainfall? 
So there's a relationship with that. Even though you're getting uh, intense, very strong rainfall, but just 10 minutes, versus a little less intense, but for 24 hours. So if you plot the duration in x-axis and plot the intensity in y-axis, you can see the, 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 I call it envelope to trigger uh, landslides. For example, let's say if uh, these are the, 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 it is color coded. So China is, you see blue is China, the US is somewhere here. So the Santa Cruz mountain in the US is similar to what they have in Hong Kong, Japan, China, Indonesia a little high. And then Taiwan, Italy, and the rest of the US are a little low here. And then this is for the, the, the wildfire related debris flow. So how it goes is this. Let's say this is the rainfall intensity. So we got about, uh, uh, I would say, 12 and, 12 and a half millimeter per hour. That is half inches of rain per hour. That was close to what we got in Montecito uh, uh, this January. And then, if the duration is, let's say, uh, 0.4, means about 24 minutes. If you have half an inch of rain per hour, just for 24 minutes, then it hits this line. So even though it's the same rainfall, longer duration, it is above the envelope. Did you see that? Then that will trigger landslide. Or higher intensity for the same du duration triggers landslide. This is a very simple uh, uh, graph I, 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 I made. But there are tons of different graphs uh, available all over the world. And even in our 2014 report, uh, we, uh, we, we put them in. But this is a very simple example. So from that, I could see if actually intensity in Montecito was 12.5, that's half an inch per hour. And the duration was, let's say, an hour. It's obvious that that will trigger debris flow. So this is the way how we predict whether it will. Uh, I mean, good news in the US, that's what I saw is we have tons of tools. Our, our, our weather forecasting service is so good. We can predict the amount of rainfall coming in. We can go with a conservative high number and at the same time duration. And then we can fit everything in to see whether that will trigger mudslide or not. So uh, this is a, a very important a tool for us to evacuate ourselves. And intense rainfall, again, I'm continuing. Do you remember this? This La Conchita, you see, 1994, this triggered, the landslide triggered with heavy rainfall. It was unprecedented rainfall. And 2005, in the same area, 1994, 1995, it didn't kill that many people. But 2005, after 10 years, it got reactivated and killed people. Right? So the thing is, once we get the rainfall, we get landslide triggered, even though it does not kill people, we have to be cautious about the, uh, the next pot potential landslide. So this is the graph we created. You see, when, if you know the intensity of rainfall, then you can estimate the CPS velocity. Higher the CPS velocity, that means quickly the water can trickle down to, to saturate the depth of soil and trigger shallow landslides. This is in our backyard. Bluebird Canyon landslide. So in 2005, we were unfortunate that early June, we had this landslide. Uh, fortunately, I mean, uh, it didn't kill people, but you see it destroyed so many buildings. Occurred, and, and then a few days after that, we have La Conchita. But both of them had history. Both of them were mobilized in the old landslide mass. So these are examples of rotational slides, but La Conchita Flew. When it comes to this type of situation, once it triggers, the speed is very, very fast. And it can kill people, it can, it, it can destroy the buildings. Uh, the same thing for uh, the Bluebird Canyon. It was rainfall. And the rainwater percolated down, recharged the water table, and then it uh, slid down. But the good thing is now it is completely re it is re redone, it is stable, people are back. And I actually uh, admire that one among, this is one among the the most successful uh, the prevention work. And that did not involve too many controversies. Whenever landslide comes, there are tons of controversies coming. 
uh, but this was uh, fortunate enough. And this is famous landslide, also landslide. So it also had a history. It was sliding down. You see, the thing is, when the mass is, the, the origin of these rotational slides are solely erosion. In your backyard, if you have small, let's say one foot by one foot erosion, then slowly every year that increases, increases. That becomes bigger, bigger, bigger. And at some point after five, if you don't do anything, seven or eight years after that, it will threaten your house if your house is on the slope, right? So like that, to, to get this huge mass coming down, we need to have history, right? And this area, this is in also in Washington, and it killed so many people, and it was in media for so long. Uh, and the, see the flow. Did you see the pattern? It is similar to La Conchita, right? So it, it separated out from the horizon, and then it, the, the flow mass was pretty big, and it destroyed so many houses. It blocked the river for the time being, right? And if you want to see a close look of that, you see this is uh, the, the, the head here, and these are the type of soil that flew away, that killed people, and that destroyed buildings. Reason? Rainfall. But after this uh, earthquake, we also, you see, when big mass of soil coming down, then that triggers earthquake. Not the earthquake coming from the fall, but three, four magnitude earthquakes are common. Uh, it, it shakes the ground. Uh, and the worst, this is the worst consequence we have. You, you, are, you see, if the river gets dammed with the big mass. You see, same thing. It's a rotational slide. It is in, that's the, this is one among the worst landslides in the, in the country. It, it, it is called Thistle Landslide in Utah. That was the first federal emergency declared landslide, uh, the declared incidents in Utah. It was in 1983. What happened was it is with snow melts and the rainfall, uh, the whole mass of soil came down and blocked the river. And then it got, you see, it created artificial lake here and uh, completely inundated few houses in the area. There was a, the railway line. It got completely destroyed. And good news was the, the, the people working here were able to make a tunnel under the, the dam to drain the water out. It did not convert into a big disaster, but it was one among the largest. So the consequence, if, if it flows and completely blocks the river, you can see these type of consequences here. This is the whole mountain came down, blocked a river. It is in Italy. It is called violent landslide. What happened, there is a dam here somewhere in the downstream. When they made dam, you see the, the area is vulnerable. You see the mountains, a lot of potential landslides. When you start filling in the reservoir, the water table goes up, and then that triggers landslide. It triggered big landslide that blocked it. What happens was that went to the, uh, the inundated water and created about over 200 meter, so 600, 700 foot high wave. It's like a na the landslide triggered tsunami. And that overtopped the violent uh, dam. And then that flood, uh, I mean, over 2 million cubic meter of uh, that flood went down and then swept away, completely washed away seven villages, killed almost 2,000 people. Fortunately, this landslide did not do that although it did a uh, huge disaster. So the, the consequence is that. This is uh, the, the case in Nepal. What happened was, you see, the whole mountain came down and blocked the river. There is no flow of water here, right? So it flew. And then 145 people died in the incidents, right? But you see, but that is more than half of the entire people living in the area, in, in those areas. Fortunately, naturally, the, 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 the dam was pressed out. Naturally, the, the nature helped to bridge the dam out, and the incidence was that, not that bad. But you see, because it was in Nepal, which is in the north of India, if this dam would have been bridged out, this would affect not only Nepal, all the way to India. So landslide dams are dangerous. Sometimes landslide dams are forgiving. This is a landslide dam, 500 years old. So uh, 
it came down from here, completely blocked the river. Did you see that? Right? And then now river is converted into a nice, uh, the, 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 uh, the flat area. And when you are making hydropower station, you, don't, you are getting that 500, 600 foot, foot deep head for the hydropower generation pretty easily. Uh, that's, uh, they have a hydropower station somewhere here. Uh, it's about a half a billion dollar project, mm, pretty close to 500 megawatt hydropower capacity. They are sometimes forgiving. Uh, but the danger is these type of soil you have here, they're dangerous for settlement during earthquake. Uh, but landslide dams are sometimes forgiving. And a lot of places in, in Europe, they use dam on those landslide, uh, landslide dams. And you know, at the upstream of those landslide dams, they call it floating dam. Sometimes you're fortunate, not whole mountain come down, it blocks half of the river. Right? And then, it, yeah, it is bad, but at least it did not block the river. And it also depends on the water current in the river. The other cause for the landslide is rapid snow melt. So this snow melt during the, uh, the, uh, the dry season, and then it will recharge the water table to cause big landslides. And this is a paddy field, you see. What they do is when you are making those rice fields, you have to put clay on the surface to make it impermeable, to just collect the water in. And if that clay cracks, mostly clays, when they are dry, they crack pretty easily. And then that's the source of percolation of water to trigger landslides. Water level changes, these are wells. You can monitor them from the well. Higher the water table, the dangerous the, uh, it is dangerous for landslides. So the coastal evolution is an uh, interesting thing. You see, this is, this happened in 2013 in uh, that, that Ensenada Highway. So there was no rainfall. No earthquake, but it triggered down. That's mainly, you see, if you have rainfall, it waits for a while to recharge the water table to cause slides. So this was triggered with the combination of small earthquake and small amount of rainfall. So you have two things mixed up, then you get landslides like that. Look into it. This is somewhere here. Now there, I took this picture uh, last year, last November. So they are repairing it. But see, entire area, it's a coastal, it's a Pacific Ocean. Only we have political boundary, but if you see, look into the, the, the geology or pattern, it is nothing different than what we have in, uh, in Southern California. See, potential landslide. What happens in those coastal area is like this uh, Portuguese Bend landslide. You see, there's a pipeline that you have. In the Portuguese Bend, you can see all those undulations here. It's impossible to repair them now if we don't have a lot of money. So the common thing between all these things is the coastal, those shells, they are very weak. And then Big Sur landslide, it is also uh, in the coastal area, right? So Highway 1, if you look into the close picture of that, this is a Big Sur landslide. It's still closed. This is the aerial view of that. You see, this is a Big Sur landslide. Look into it. All of them are landslide topography. So, one slide, so there is equal potential for, potential for the others to slide too, right? What is causing that is it is coastal area. This is one of the research I, uh, I do, I have been doing, and I'm known in the world for this is, you see, when you have the shales, that type of special type of mineral that we have in those coastal area, let's say just go with the number, the resistance we call it friction angle. If the resistance is only 10 degrees here, just go with that number. If that soil mixes with salt that we have in the coastal area, right, during the formation process, the strength increases. So if you go to the coastal area, if you toss the soil as like a needle, very strong, right? But when you have landslide or any type of fracture or joint formation, then what happens is then it is stable because you have now you have 2.5. Five times more strength than the, the, the original time it was firm, you know, uh, firmed. With the rainfall, all those salt water leaches out. It returns back to its original shape. Now, you see, it is stable with this strength. And when you have crack and those things, water percolates down from there. And then it keeps on losing the strength. The strength drops by 2.5 times. And then 
when it, it comes to the point where it cannot hold it, it slides down. So coastal area is very vulnerable to landslide for this reason. Even though there is no rainfall, but the rainfall we had, let's say, two months ago, it is slowly percolating down to leach the sodium chloride or the salt with it. The volcanic eruption, as I told you, you see, it changes the ground. This is from Japan. You see, in 2000, there was Mount Uso eruption. The flat area became big hill, uh, and it changes all topography. Plus, when you have these type of volcanic eruptions, that weathers the soil. It is a chemical weathering of the soil. It makes the soil very vulnerable to trigger landslides like that. Earthquakes. As I told you, earthquakes sometimes trigger big landslides, but mostly they trigger small landslides, like rock falls and shallow uh, type of landslides like this. It is from uh, the, the 2015 Nepal earthquake. And uh, this is, uh, even if you plot the magnitude uh, uh, with the ground acceleration due to earthquake and the number of landslide, you can easily estimate how many number of landslides we're expecting. Uh, for example, for uh, the Northridge, this is the Northridge. So uh, we, we got about 11,000 landslides after Northridge earthquake. Uh, as you can see, earthquake does not trigger that much landslide. So I'm moving a little quickly here. So rainfall uh, triggers, you see, Rainfall causes two effects. If it is dense soil, it can create, if it is loose soil, it will not create crack, and the earthquake would help uh, to stabilize the mass. But if it is larger, dense soil, it creates uh, crack in it, and the water percolates in it, and then it creates uh, landslides. The anthropogenic cause, you can see wildfire. This is from Montecito area. Before the, uh, the uh, the wildfire after the wildfire. You can see, uh, and then this is from 2014 uh, wildfire. We got tons of uh, uh, debris flow with that incidence. And then sometimes if you're making faulty infrastructure, you get landslides like that, stone quarrying and not protecting, you get landslides like that. Bad water management converts into these type of landslides. Uh, right now, let's go to skew examples. In 2015, uh, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan triggered. You see, the worst thing is, you see, once you have, this is before the, uh, the earthquake, and this is after the earthquake. And what happens was big mass came down and then bifurcated into two. So houses here were safe, and the houses here got damaged, and people died. Houses here got damaged like that. And then this is another, and this is the damage you can see. This, this is another spectacular example, you see, like that. The mass came down. Do this way, the houses here, is about 15 or 16 houses, got completely buried, people died, but this was safe. Think about it. If you would have changed the direction, this should have been gone, and these areas should have been safe, right? So you never know so how it changes its path. See the disaster uh, after those, uh, those slides, like that. Fortunately, this hotel was safe. Like, this is pretty similar to what we have in Southern California. You see, we cut the mountain and take dirt out, soil out, and fill there, we develop housing, right? That has most potential to have landslides, like you can see here. Before the earthquake and after the earthquake, the area slid down. You can see here, the house is destroyed like that. Sometimes it blocks the river. In this example, it was blocking the river. If it would have been that the na Japanese will naturally bridge them, otherwise the bridge would have been gone. So with the Nepal earthquake, what you have is uh, like, uh, you see, at 4 degree, very gentle slope, it slid down because earthquake reduced the strength of the soil. And then there was encroachment close to the river. Right? You see the houses got tilted like that. You see the house got, houses got separate there, about 25 houses like that. And that, that, land, that earthquake triggered about 15,000 landslides. Uh, over uh, 3,500 of them were larger than 1,000 square foot. So this near the epicenter. You see a whole mass was sliding down. See the type of landslides. See the boulders coming down. And when I was there, still the, ma the soil was coming down. So like that. Some of them came down and blocked the river, and then it got inundated like that. You see it blocked 
the river, and then some of them came down and then affected the community. This is the close view of this one. It is threatening the community while it is blocking the river. Now let's come to our thing here, the Thomas Fire area. But Montecito is the place where we had the issue, right? So this area got debris, debris flow. The estimated rainfall intensity was 12.5 millimeter. I already showed you that dot when we talked about the uh, rainfall. So, so this area got about 125 millimeter of uh, five inches of rainfall in 24 hours. You see, this, got, this area got more rainfall than any other area. And then these are the places where we got debris flow coming down. See, the, I have a picture from this area. So see, this is a wildfire area. What wildfire does is first it destroys the vegetation cover. Second thing, what it does, it burns the, uh, the soil. That way, soil is less permeable. It doesn't let the water percolate down. And then you have ashes that is water repellent. So that way, whatever amount of water coming down, it does not let it go under the ground. It will flow as a runoff. More the runoff, more debris coming down. Right? So see the debris. This is from, I took this picture from this point. See the, the size of the debris coming down. And it came, and then it blocked. The, the streams, and this is Highway uh, uh, 101. See, the whole area is full of uh, those mudslides like that. And it, th these are debris traps. But some of the debris traps were working. Some of them, they are overflown. Uh, but we lost 20 people and hundreds of houses. See the size of the debris? And there was few debris were uh, boulders. Few boulders were over 20 foot size. The worst thing is this. Trees. Trees came down. What happened was like that. Trees came down, blocked the path of the, uh, the flow, and then the bridge got completely washed away like that. And this, those houses were you know, damaged like this. The debris went down. The worst thing is if you have a tree coming to this area and blocking it, it happened there. A lot of trees were here blocking the, the, uh, the culvert or the, the bridge. And then the debris changed the path. And that this area got significant damage. The mother nature, like that. You see the house was almost full of uh, those mudslides. So you cannot control, you cannot predict the mother nature. One thing we do is we you know, evacuate the I mean, We just try to evacuate ourselves from the problem. So this is another bridge washed away. But the thing is, it was the gas pipe, and then it got fire. And then some of the uh, pipelines there in those area, pipeline got uh, the, the, the damaged. And then a lot of water coming out on top of everything you are getting from the mother nature. So like that, you see, the, a lot of those culverts were full of debris. And then you have those trees. And then there had no option then overflowing. So still, this area has the, the burnt and business is coming up, but not completely recovered. OK, so precaution that I want to uh, uh, you know, take when you, uh, against the landslide and mudslide disasters. Attention to old debris flow and the landslide areas. Be careful. Don't forget the history. And then attention to you know, precipitation pattern, weather forecast. And attention to geological, geomorphological, and the geotechnical conditions. And then attention to past wildfire. They are dangerous and then better water management on slopes. And the designers and planners, we need to pay attention to multiple factors when we plan our infrastructure. And then avoid the problem as, far, as much as possible. <laughs> because it, we cannot fight against the mother nature. The summary, if I summarize it, natural disasters are inevitable. We cannot control it. But learning about those just disasters help us to prepare against their consequences. Uh, the, each country has potential of specific type of, and each state in the U.S. has its own potential type of natural disaster uh, and associated risks. And we should learn lessons from the disaster. We should not forget the history. We should not forget about the, uh, the Northridge earthquake and those 11,000 landslides that it triggered uh, and then change our guideline, design principle, based on that. And it is very important to take precautions of, for possible mudslides and landslides, specifically after the other natural disasters, like earthquake, wildfire that we get frequently, we have to be careful. And on top of that, 
If you need any help, my expert is, I'm at Cal State Fullerton in your backyard, let me know. I was a little over time, but I hope you enjoyed it.